Bingo, we're live. We're back for the, uh, gee, the 3 o'clock rock here on Think Tech. And uh, right now we have Energy in America uh, with uh, Lou Pugliarese of uh, ePrink. He joins us by uh, Skype from Washington, D.C. Uh, he is the CEO of ePrink. Uh, welcome back to the show, Lou. Hey, it's nice to be here. And, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, we live in interesting times. That's not necessarily interesting in the good sense, but certainly interesting, as the Chinese say. And uh, I like to, you know, you're in Washington. As I recall, that's where everything happens, or used to happen. <laughs> now it happens at Trump Tower. Um, people's real lives. <laughs> so tell us, what, what does the president, the president-elect offer here, and how is it going to change energy, among other things? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, there is a lot of discussion of what the Trump agenda is, and I discerning it is not easy. I, I will be the first to admit that. I do think, we, as we, we talked about this a little earlier, but one of the, you know, one of the main themes you're going to see is a, I'm just not quite sure how much of a rejection of climate, but you're going to see a great deal of what we would call environmental regulatory reform. And this regulatory reform is tied in a very political way to what we might call the working middle class, the declining incomes, a traditional democratic group, which you would argue in this election, uh, Secretary Clinton did not connect with at the level she should have uh -huh. in a historic. And you know, one of the things, uh, it's very important to point out that uh, of all the governorships in the United States, only 15 now are controlled by uh, Democrats including Hawaii, uh, of uh, all the legislative seats held at the state level, the Democrats have lost about a thousand over the last eight years. So even though there's a lot of activity in Washington, I think there was a growing, at least political recognition, that there was a disconnect from what the elite wanted to do in a lot of areas, including the environment, and uh, what the perception was among, rightly or wrongly, but was the perception among a lot of what we might call the working middle class, or, uh, you know, the people out there in, in so-called flyover country. So, uh, two but what, You know, what you say really uh, resonates with me. It's right. not just that, um, you know, the, the group who voted for Trump arose during the campaign. There was a dissatisfaction going on for a long time. And, and these, um, you know, Democratic uh, legislators, a thousand of them across the country, uh, were, you know, were evaporating over a period of years. So when you we start connecting the dots on this, what you get is a is a process. It didn't start a year ago. It started many years ago, at least at least seven or eight, anyway. I agree with that, and I do think there is a disconnect. And, and I I want to show you this in a couple of examples. I think we can get a little bit more to climate and to and to solar and what's going on there, what it means, I think it means a lot less than people are worried about. But there were two, two, there are literally hundreds of issues underway now. And in fact, there's something called the Congressional Review Act, you'll watch it in January, in which they will take all, which they will take a group of regulations that were promulgated after May 30th, and they can be rescinded by the Congress. And I think Trump will sign them into law. In fact, the basic debate in the Senate right now is they don't have enough time mm -hmm. to rescind all the regulations they want to rescind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they're fired up in this issue. But I thought it would be interesting to look at where some of this resentment might be coming from, right? Uh, the first one is, I don't know if, she, if you can get one of these, uh, one of these uh, graphs up or one of these pictures up, but... The first one is CAFE standards, right? And CAFE standards are... Let's, let's put the picture of the car up. Yeah, take, a, let's, take a look at Steve McQueen. He, he was always a hero of mine. So corporate average fuel economy uh, standards are standards which determine um, what the miles per gallon the auto manufacturers must pay, both in terms of the footprint and their fleet. And... The, these are these jobs producing cars are, uh, uh, you know, by auto workers, auto workers in the U.S. And there are lots of trade issues that Trump talks about. But one of the first things we're going to see is 
we're going through what's called a midterm review on the auto, so it's a reset. The question is, should we go to a higher standard after 2018? Trump, in my opinion, will not do so. Ah. Will, will not do so. He's going to hold the standards where they are today. And he's going to do that because of the disconnect between what the standards call for in terms of the fleet and what the customers, the potential purchasers of the cars want to buy. And if that disconnect gets too high, there's stranded capital and there's also uh, uh, loss of jobs, a real chance of the industry losing some jobs because the regulatory program is pushing the industry to produce a set of vehicles that the customers do not want to buy. Mm -hmm. And so people say, well, isn't this terrible? You know, we need to get these higher standards and everything. And so I have this, uh, this picture here of Steve McQueen driving in the iconic film Bullet, driving a 1968 Ford Mustang GT Fastback, which, by the way, if you listen to the film, uh, which had a, a soundtrack, you will hear a lot of double clutching. This was, in fact, not required since this was a four-speed. <laughs> but but macho, plenty macho. <laughs> what's interesting about the 68, uh, 325 horsepower Mustang GT that he drove at that time, that car generated, spewed out, about one ton of criteria pollutants. That would be volcanic, volcanic organic carbon, uh, 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 compounds, uh, nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compounds, all these bad things, lead, one ton over 100,000 miles. If you bought that car today, if you bought Steve McQueen's Mustang, but you got a 2016 model, it would generate 10 pounds over 100,000 miles. That's a small, so, tiny fraction. A small, tiny fraction. So this gets back to a central theme um, what I call the law of diminishing returns. Yet, the regulators want to push this much further, right? And the auto guys are saying, what are you doing, okay? The cars are pretty clean. Why do you want to go higher? Why do you want to impose a higher cost with such a low yield? Well, and what's what's the higher, what are the detriments of going higher? The detriment of going higher is that you are spending a lot of money and, and it depends what you view as a lot of money. If you talk to the auto companies, if you raise the cost of a car four or five, six hundred dollars, people leave the showroom. You know, for a, you know, for a, a, you know, a high roller like you, Jay, that's not a big deal. But you know, for an average working man like me, that's a big deal. Spending another five, six hundred dollars for a car, and so it affects the total sales, and it's not really doing that much for the environment. Yeah, you know, uh, if we have some time, one of these times we might talk about California, where the same thing is happening. The second decision I think Trump will make, and he will make this on the first day, is he will authorize the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. And I, I sent you a graphic on that as well. Yeah, let's like take a look at that graphic now too. Yeah. yeah. Now, that project, if I were to give you a map of the North America of where all the pipelines are, you would hardly be able to see the map because the country is just crisscrossed by pipelines. Mm -hmm. But in that particular project, I think, where even the president said, and you can see the one section there that's being constructed, that it really was a symbolic gesture more than a real one. Mm -hmm. That project would have provided jobs for working middle class people, lots of them Hispanics, of black Americans, the international laboring organi laborers or organization. And when I went to the last hearing of that event held by the State Department, in the middle of the room were all the people who came early. And these were mostly young millennials and beards and sandals and their mothers. And to the right side were all the laborers in orange jackets who had jobs, so they couldn't come in the middle of the night and get in line to be the first to speak. And I just was wondering, you know, as for the Democrats, this is their constituency. Yet they were dissing these guys in a fundamental way. And, you know, you may see all these protests about Keystone XL and all that, but even the president's own analysis said, well, it doesn't really affect 
uh, oil sands production from Canada because they can move it by rail or out of truck or other things. So I, I do think this is part of the political disconnect where we moved the discussion on environmental issues from a technocratic debate, a technological debate, to a political ideological yeah, debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe that Democrats are paying a price for this. I mean, I think there are lots of things going on besides that. But I do well, think... Talk about coal. Is it the same process? So coal is quite interesting. For me, for coal, is that most of the adjustment in coal is taking place because of the rapid expansion of very inexpensive uh, natural gas. Now, politicians like to take credit for stuff. And I think this is another elite problem. They wanted to take credit for all the great environmental achievements. And I believe the Democrats, the Democrats might have done that to some excess. Instead of saying, you know, the market itself is driving us to a lower GHG emission profile because we have this fracking and we have all this natural gas and it's driving uh, out uh, coal. Now maybe I would argue the regulatory program in the Clean Power Plan is probably accelerating it. But the Clean Power Plan is also, I would say, dead. Now one of the interesting things after we go through all this is to see what it really does to the emissions profile to the U.S. My guess is we're on a certain trajectory now. And if the government pulls out, it's not going to have a major effect. But we haven't done the research on that yet. That's an important question. Yeah, it's an important question. So you, I guess your proposition is it's not some of the things that he has been uh, promising and some of the Trump and some of the things that he is likely to do are not all that bad. No, not everything is easy. And so now if we get to the issue of wind and solar, these are driven in part by so-called uh, production tax credits, renewable portfolio standards, and the production tax credits are issued at the federal level. I suspect those credits will not, they're going to phase out over a period of th the next four years. Whether they will get axed earlier, I, I doubt it. And uh, they are largely, in, in, in the, but the use of these uh, renewables within the utility sector is really a state issue more than a federal issue at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And I don't see these plans uh, retreating substantially. I mean, we do know that if you have a, a, if you don't solve the battery problem, you do have problems with intermittent renewables at 15 to 20 percent of the grid. So, we, you know, I mean, I guess it's a question of degree. Um, at, at some point, the CAFE standards, you know, simply, you know, not economic. Um, yeah, at not some point, economic. coal goes away. It's, at some point, uh, the you know. Is too low. Go ahead. The yield is too low, I think. Yeah. We should allocate our environmental budget where we get the highest return, not whatever hobby horse that sounds good. And this is actually really an elite problem because elites love electric cars, right? But some poor guys working two jobs in East LA to mail the money to Sacramento so a wealthy Hollywood producer can buy an electric Tesla for $120,000 and get a $30,000 rebate. This stuff is starting to come home in my, it's a subtle way, people don't really they really can't put their finger on it, but they have a sense that there's a disconnect from their lives when they're having trouble making ends meet. You can ever, never underestimate the importance of energy in our country and the world. And now uh, you can never underestimate the connection of energy and, um, and, and politics. And Absolutely. I think, you know, we're going to see some very interesting changes here. And um, I guess there are two, you know, polarized camps on this, the environmental and and uh, on the other hand, they, I call them the traditional energy people. And um, we're going we're to see this battled in the next few months, I think. Oh, yeah. I think that's going to be, I mean, as they say, heads are exploding in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, Lou Pugliarisi. Uh, he's, he's the one with the funny uh, University of Hawaii shirt. I guess they're wearing them all over Washington, D.C. now. I do. <laughs> and I, I think it's very nice that you put it on for our show. We're going to take a short break, Lou. When we come back, I'd like to talk about the 
decline of the solar installation industry in Hawaii and on the mainland. Why? Yes. What's happening and what will happen? We'll be right back with Lou Pugliaresi. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii over the coming weeks and the alternative fuel supply chains necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. We are going to invite in and we will have significant interviews with various stakeholders, including our producers, which are our farmers and our scientists, our conversion technologies, including Terviva, who we'll see in two weeks, as well as our consumers. Uh, within there, we're also going to have the investor groups necessary to make sure that this uh, can advance. So I do hope you join us as we explore our deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii. Okay, we're back. We're live with Energy in America, featuring uh, Lou Pugliarisi of ePrink in Washington, D.C. He joins us by Skype. Now, in this part of the show, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the decline of the solar installation industry in Hawaii and on the mainland. It's been, uh, it's been going down for some time. We've had uh, you know, regular stats on this from um, their building permit stats involving installation jobs uh, from Marco Mangelsdorf. And, and you can also see that a lot of these companies going out of business or going into some other business something dramatic has been happening in the solar industry not only with local small companies but with much larger ones so lou what's going on why is this happening why is it happening nationally this way um and you know how serious is it so solar solar is clearly an intermittent supply in fact you could argue that you might be able to place in some parts of west texas and the midwest of the u.s wind where you have a higher probability of lowering your intermittency but the wind doesn't blow all the time but you can do research and find places where it blows more than than usual of it. but the thing but solar we sort of know what its limitations are it's when the sun is up mm -hmm. and we do know a couple of things we know that when the utility grid itself when the whole system to generate power to deliver to families homes and people's uses is when the intermittent supply gets anywhere from 15 to 18 percent the cost structure begins to rise very rapidly and the um i would say the uh, you know the grid can even become unstable and this is not necessarily something that has to happen if we had a way to store power right if we had a way to store power and we could do it cheaply and the cost of storing it and the cost of drawing it back from that storage facility were cheap, well, then the solar would be a fantastic fit. Well, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, that's really a provocative idea, that, that we're having a problem now with solar in installation, that whole industry, people are out of work, they're closing the doors and all. But if we had had, looking back retrospectively, if we had had uh, cheap and, um, you know, uh, high-capacity uh, storage systems, uh, say five years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It would have saved the solar industry. It would have avoided the decline. I think that's what you're saying, eh? Right. But the question was the government in Hawaii, and as well as the federal government, provided a, a, a set of subsidies and support, which actually resulted in very unbalanced growth. I, I mean, I think solar makes a lot of sense in Hawaii, but the question is, um, it is intermittent. It is by its very nature intermittent, and unless you solve that problem, mm -hmm. and remember, I think the, and the other problem is, of course, um, the people were permitted to sell power into the grid at average cost when its marginal value at certain times of the day was put back into the grid was quite low. Yeah. And so the, even the time of day pricing wasn't quite settled yet. And, you know, of course, what happened is things got so unstable that uh, HECO decided, you know, well, not only are we not going to let new customers sell to the grid, we're just not going to authorize the, per, the permission. And, and I think we talked about this before. The, the state budget 
of the state of Hawaii, I think at one time exceeded over $200 million in direct subsidies for solar installations. That's a lot of bread. You know, I remember That's that uh, when we had a tax credit for technology yeah. here in the best part of the first uh, decade of, of the new century, uh, there was all kinds of resistance politically to the fact that uh, we'd spent over a hundred million on tax credits for the development of the tech industry. But that looks actually pretty small compared to what we have spent and what we could spend on solar tax credits. Yeah, and on these things, if, the, if you're going to do this, you just have to make sure, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze. And I might get the, the payout, once again, the payout is just not there. It's just not there. That money would have been some. I think you, you want to have a vibrant solar industry, but they would have been much better off if they organized the subsidy program at a more slower pace to allow it to build out, con, you know, concurrently with storage technology. Yes, yes. and and yeah, and and uh, support the development of the storage technology as okay. part of these these projects. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it seems to me that w when oil went down, you know, not that many years ago, how long has it been? Two years, maybe? Um, maybe three? Oil went down so dramatically, that changed the spreadsheets. And when uh, the solar installers would ap approach the homeowner, the whole, the whole transaction would be based on uh, the appeal of those spreadsheets. Look at how much money you're going to save. Yeah, Here, yeah. Here's a dollars and cents. It's real. You can touch it. You can, you know, take it to the bank. And that just didn't come true. So, you know, you, and the spreadsheets got thinner and thinner and are pretty thin now. And it's harder to sell. And the low-hanging fruit customers have already been sold. Exactly. So it's a real struggle for them. Yeah, I mean, I, there could have been ways. I think that uh, there could have been ways in which the utility, depending how it was managed, in which it could have engaged in very selective long-term deals, but... They would have to distribute the solar in the right spots on the grid. It requires a lot of planning, lest I say central planning. Utility is a managed system. And unless you manage the whole network, you're going to get a lot of imbalances. Yeah. So where's it going to go, Lou? I mean, right now we are at a low point, and, and I'd say that it feels almost long term because some of the companies that were making a lot of money before doing a lot of installations are gone. Some of the expert uh, installers are in other businesses, other trades, um, and and you know people are generally discouraged about it. And I think they probably feel to go back to the first part of our conversation is the federal government's not excited about renewables anyway these days, or won't be starting January 21st. Um, so you know this is not a good time for the so, so what's going to happen? I mean, solar is the backbone of the development of renewable energy in Hawaii and probably the mainland. It's where the action is in terms of moving to those 100% goals. Um, we, sounds like those 100% goals are more difficult now. So let me tell you a story. Last week I went to a presentation at the uh, Italian Embassy, and a guy was there from SNAM. SNAM is, a, is the main infrastructure, monster infrastructure company in Europe based in Italy. And he threw up a, a final slide to his presentation. And he said, you know, it's quite interesting. The European Union wants to electrify the continent, right? We have electric cars and a lot of renewables. And the cost of electrifying the European continent by, I mean, electrifying in a renewable sense, yeah, by 2040 was 250 billion euros. Yet, for a fraction of that cost, he could hook up gas throughout the European continent and get virtually the same reduction in climate. That's not it's Russian gas, is it? R Russian gas is slightly unpredictable these days. Yes, yeah, but, the, this, but the, they would be relying on eastern Mediterranean gas and Azeri gas and U.S. LNG. So I, I do think that you have to have as broad a possible set of alternatives if you commit to a single strategy, if, you're, if you don't have something which is robust against uncertainty, and you don't think about this uncertainty in a fundamental way, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. Yeah, we you haven't really come to terms that. yet with this. Yeah. So what's your advice? Uh, two people need advice on this. One is um, 
The president needs, the president-elect needs advice, Congress needs <laughs> advice, and I, the homeowner, need advice. Um, for that matter, you know, the regula regulators in Hawaii need advice. What, where's a, where, what advice would you give on how to, you know, deal with all the change we're having? Well, I do think that the, you know, they have to ask themselves, why are you doing this? If you're doing the solar to cut your utility bill, and it's not cutting your utility bill, because it's fundamentally a costly process to produce power. And remember, power is not just the instantaneous part. It's the capacity to deliver it instantaneously across the entire uh, day-night cycle. Right? If, in fact, your strategy has a huge risk profile that spikes the cost, well, it's probably not a good strategy. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back and look at, okay, until we get some ways to store power, we're going to need cost-effective dispatchable power. And cost-effective dispatchable power is by its nature not intermittent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unfortunate. I, I, I understand the problem people are having, but... Well, that, that takes me to a show we had last week with a scientist uh, from University of Hawaii um, School of Ocean Earth Science. Mm -hmm. He's into um, um, marine uh, engineering. Yeah. And he, he's a big fan of OTEC. Uh, in fact, uh, in many ways, he's the father of OTEC here. His name is Hans Krock. And he's, um, you know, he's been teaching people all around the Pacific Rim about OTEC for a long time. And they're taking it more seriously in places outside of Hawaii than inside. But you know, where do you feel OTEC can go? And I realize it's something you can only do on the coasts and near the ocean, um, and maybe on platforms in the ocean. Uh, but is, and, and maybe only by using uh, hydrogen as a method of storage. But what do you think? Where does it fit? Because it is dispatchable, completely dispatchable. It's constant. It has very little uh, you know, negative effect on the environment. Uh, where does that fit in your picture of, of uh, renewables going forward? I think it's a great idea. The question is, what does it cost? Can he deliver OTEC right, at... 30 cents a kilowatt hour in Hawaii, day in, day out. And, you know, what does it take? You know, as we've talked about many times, inexhaustible does not mean inexpensive. Right? <laughs> yes. and, uh, if OTEC deliver, and, you know, how, if the environmental benefit, you know, it's clearly uh, does not generate any GHG emissions. But even if it, you know, and so, but it has to, sh you know, we have to kind of look at the numbers. You know. yeah. As we said, you know, in God we trust, everybody else has to be. <laughs> it always comes back to that, doesn't it? We're talking about a, a micro, macro economic analysis, exactly. and we'll continue that as we go forward. Yeah. Uh, this is energy in America, always studying the, the larger picture, the macro energy economic picture with uh, Lou Pugliarisi of EPRINC. Uh, who joins us reg regularly every two weeks um, on Skype from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Lou. Looking forward to our next time together. Thank you, Jay. It was great. Aloha. Good. Aloha.